Thank you, Wesley. You don't know how much we appreciate your volunteering to help out. It takes a little bit of uh, getting used to after a while, but believe me, it does get easier. I think most anybody who has done something before an audience for the very first time remembers that first time. Um, maybe not fondly, but you remember it. It sort of sticks with you a little bit. Uh, I can remember my first time in leading songs. It turned out it was a much larger congregation than this. And then the second or third time, it was before about 700, 800 people. And that got my attention in a hurry, too. But we appreciate you. We appreciate you volunteering. In fact, it fits right in with something I'm going to be talking about today as well as Buddy's sermon. It continues to me to always be amazing how things I can only attribute it to God's spirit leads us to be thinking along the same lines at certain times as well as some of the things that, that Jeff brought out as well. I'm not sure who left their phone up here, but I'll put it underneath just in case it rings. <laughs> okay, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention today before we get started is just before Sabbath services, and we should have said something to uh, Jeff when he came up here, Faye asked several of us to remember her son, Roger, who has been diagnosed potentially with renal cancer. Uh, they have some pre-cancerous issues that they're going into. He will not be able to go to the doctor till later. So remember Roger, her son, in his time of need as well, as well as a young lady who we have talked about before. Uh, many of you know Brooke Brookerson, who has been uh, fighting just about everything that anyone can fight over many, many years. She's about the age of my daughter. And they were really good friends growing up in the church many years ago. She has been diagnosed that her cancer has spread now into her lungs. So please remember Brooke Brookerson. Well, her name's not it's Williams. Williams now. She remarried. And, uh, but it's a young lady I have known and had quite a relationship for many, many years over the years. So please remember her as well. <clears throat> Again, it, just, it is amazing to me how, in many cases, God works in the things that he talks about. And, uh, when Jeff mentioned the fact that this is the Sabbath, next Sabbath leading and countdown for Pentecost, that's significant in more than one way. This is the time of harvest in Israel, and it's a time of harvest as we look into the Word and to the Scriptures that we need to be focusing on that issue in our lives. Too often, as we were mentioning right before services, we sit here and wait for the doors to open for someone to walk through as opposed to going out to the highways and the byways and doing what we can to make sure that there's going to be somebody walking in that door. And that has, again, something to do with the message I'm going to bring today, as well as what Jeff mentioned concerning the webcast and all the activities going on there that are reaching out. Um, some of those statistics, if you've been keeping up with them, are increasing greatly over what they have been in the past. And it's certainly a way we're reaching out to people. All of those people will probably not enter into this congregation or some other congregation before the return of Christ. But a large number of them are going to know what it's ta it's, we're talking about. So we appreciate those who are doing that work. And in fact, all of us are doing that by our support to that as well. I have three scriptures today that we're going to be looking at very closely in the basis of what they say and how we reach what they're talking about. The first one is found over in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 26. You don't necessarily have to turn there if you don't want to because I'm going to read it and the other two very quickly, but if you want to write it down and do it later. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 26, And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And then Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, My son, forget not my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. It goes on to say, For length of days and long life, peace shall be added unto you. Let not mercy nor truth forsake you. Bind them about your neck. Write them upon the table of your heart, so that you shall find favor and good understanding in the sight of both God and and man. Do you see the connection between the three verses? We have here where in 1 Samuel, it talks about Samuel growing in favor with God and with man. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, Jesus Christ growing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. 
And then the admonition to us in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 1 that we too need to be finding favor with God and with man. Now, it's an admonition to us in Proverbs. It's an instruction to each of us. And I think we all want to achieve that in our lives. But we see the same thing spoken previously of Samuel and Christ and the, the in, inclination, the pushing, the instruction for us to do the thing, same thing. We understand, I think, keep my commandments, as it says in chapter 3 and verse 1 of Proverbs, which I think I, we know and understand intuitively almost that there is a natural principle there at work of when we find favor with man by keeping the commandments, we are living a moral and a principle to life. And I continue to be amazed at how many times people underestimate how much that is seen by other people as opposed to what we see as the norm in society today. The norm in society today is something completely different. Uh, as Jeff was mentioning and, and everything, you, you, the more you see on television news, I know some people that just turn television off, they don't want to see any news, but it does say to watch. Not necessarily watch the news necessarily, but watch, and that's one of the best places to get it, to know what is going on in this world, around this world. And it's getting more and more difficult out there, folks, in case you don't know it. I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, and I don't think I am, but it's not getting any better. It's getting worse day by day. So how do we, in following by keeping the commandments, what brings us to the point where we will find favor with man and naturally with God? But inherent in this is the assumption that all of us want to do that, that we want to find favor with God and with man. And I have heard a lot of people say over the years, I don't really care what others think about me. Well, that, it may be that we don't want to lose sleep over it, but we should care what others think about us. Because we call ourselves by a name, Christian. And if we're not living up to the example of the name that we call ourselves by, then we should be very concerned about what others think about us. There's a scripture over in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 says that Christ left us an example that we should follow his steps. I've given a sermon just recently concerning what type of a Christian am I? And that's example carrying on right there. What kind of an example are we setting to others that they would want to follow in our steps? I've had numerous people over the years tell me that Maybe they were in a restaurant and their children were behaving as opposed to the norm of children in restaurants. And someone has come over and made, actually made a comment to them. You know, did you dope them before you came? Did you give them something, you know, to put them out where they just, you know, are, are calm and cool and collected? Uh, do you beat them with a willow branch, you know, every day? Or, you know, what is the threat that you have over them that they're behaving and, and minding your manners? Um, it is a way of following in the word that God has given to us. So what should we do? Other than, as the scripture said, keep the commandments. Or we follow the admonition in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. We need to love one another. No question about that. And as it goes on to say there in Proverbs 3, not to forsake truth and mercy. Is that enough? Is that all we have to do? Are these the only admonitions that we have we should be looking forward to. One of the most common questions asked by all Christians or people who were attempting to follow what was called that way in the New Testament had to do with, again, what to do. It was in John the Baptist, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, we saw what he said there about uh, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. But in Luke chapter 3, a little bit after that, 52 is the last verse in chapter 2, in chapter, uh, uh, verse 10 of, of chapter 3, in Luke 3, it says, And the people asked him, asked John the Baptist, saying, What shall we do then? He's told them all the things that are going on. He's encouraged them to, to turn and change and repent. He answered and said unto them, He that has two coats, let him give to the, him that has none. So if you've got two coats, somebody besides you is freezing, give him your other coat. You know, I've seen an example of that on news before where someone actually going into a restaurant saw one, similar to what Buddy said, 
on the curb, homeless person, he took his coat off and he gave it to him. That's what the scripture says. Him that has two, or maybe if you've got an extra one home, you don't have it with you, but you, you can get home and get it. Give him the coat. Then in verse 12, then came also the publicans to be baptized. Now the publicans are equivalent with who? IRS, tax collectors, okay? So you'll understand what they're saying here. Master, what shall we do? I'm not sure master, when they said master, they were not a little sarcastic about that, but I'm, I can't read into the, something, maybe it's not there. And he said unto them, exact or collect in effect, no more than that which is appointed of you. Uh, it's well known throughout you know, history and everything that the tax collectors, the publicans, were very zealous, you might say, in their collection procedures. Um, maybe even more so than the IRS we have today. I don't know, but you know, it seems to be that way. And then in verse 14, Then the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages because they were known to maybe take a little bit extra from some of the people because of their authority. So again, what did John the Baptist tell these people when they said, what shall we do? Did he say, go to the synagogue this week? Did he say, make sure you're at the feast this coming you know, feast day? That wasn't what he said, was it? Now, these three groups of people represent a fairly good cross-selection of society. And I think we, too, might sometime ask some of the same questions, what to do. But I'm afraid that too often we get so tied up in doctrinal arguments, we can become content and satisfied with our own Sabbath fellowship. We attend church once a week, and we fellowship with those of like mind, although in more and more cases it seems like sometimes those who are attending with us are not always of like mind because there seems to be some contention going as well. And then we go our way. You know, the problem with going to church, it sometimes works like a vaccine. We attend a few times and pretty soon we become immune to the whole thing. We begin to take it for granted. Author and theologian Garrison Keillor once said, maybe none of you have never heard of him, but He's got quite a bit of writings he's done over the years. He says, you can become a Christian by going to church just about as easy as you can become a car by sleeping in a garage. Any of you a car? Have you tried that lately? <clears throat> I think the, the analogy is well taken in the sense of what he was talking about here. Again, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, everybody knows here what that says. Repent and be baptized then what okay I think most everybody in this room has repented and they have been baptized so now what well let's skip down a couple of verses in Acts 2 go to verse 44 and says and all that believed were together and they had all things in common they sold their possessions and their goods and parted them to all men as every man had need why did they do that why would they come together, sell all their possessions, bring everything together into one pot? Uh, David Koresh did this down in Waco. You know what happened down there. As well as many other religious outlying groups over the years have done similar situations. And this is one of the scriptures they look at. They came together, sold all their possessions, lumped it all together. And in most cases, unfortunately, there's some kind of a tyrant that is running the whole organization. It's for his own good for the most part. But what did they say? Down to, to Acts chapter 2 and verse 44 again. They did it because every man had needs. They were there trying to reach and to take care of the people. It wasn't just because this was something that they thought would be good to do, that it was a religious thing to do. It was the thing Christ had commanded them to do. It was done out of the needs of the people at that particular time. You have to understand the, the, the things that were going on in society at that time. Now, <clears throat> turn over now to Galatians chapter 6. Buddy, got a couple of my scriptures here but that's okay we'll just emphasize them again a little bit more Galatians chapter 6 beginning in verse 1 brethren if a man be overtaken in a fault and I'm going to read all the way through from here from verse 1 to verse 10 then we're going to go back and talk about them a little bit brethren if a man be overtaken in a fall you which are spiritual who's spiritual no hands necessarily 
Who is spiritual? It's he who has God's Holy Spirit. How many of you have God's Holy Spirit? Any of you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. In verse 2. In verse 3, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Verse 5, For every man shall bear his own burden. Verse 6, Let him that is taught in the word communicate. And this is not the, the common word that would be used, I think probably the NIV and some others. It, it's simply talking about you help people financially if necessary with whatever they need. It's sort of like the needs in common where they came together. Help people and unto him that teaches in all good things. Be not deceived in verse 7. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit leap, reap life everlasting. And then in verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing. Don't get tired. Don't say, you know, I've done this, I've done that, and I've done all I can do. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And then in verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men but especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now that's a pretty extensive litany of things we can do. You know, we, the, the people ask in these scriptures we've looked at, and I've had people ask me too, what can I do? As if they, there's nothing they think they can do. In verse number one, you which are spiritual, you which have God's Holy Spirit, restore one overtaken in a fault. Now, there's all kinds of examples I could give you on this, but I think you all understand. If you see someone having need beside you, help them, assist them. And in most cases, or a lot of cases, all it means is listening to them talk, to have a willing shoulder to cry upon, as it were, to be willing to listen to someone, to give them good advice, to financially help them if they have a difficulty. If they're having trouble with something going on in their lifetime, help them, work with them. Now, if it's someone who's maybe not in our church congregation or whatever, um, you could invite them to church. But the scriptures don't ever say that in that sense of word. When you say, what can I do? Tell them to go to church. Tell them to keep the feast. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking for help in the problem they have at that particular time. Now, maybe that's where you can get in the long term and where you want to get. But too often we think this is the panacea. In verse number two, bear one another's burdens and it really goes a lot along with number one in one sense of the word how do we do in bearing somebody else's burdens do we help them if we see someone in need do we assist them but he gave a, a, a numerable examples of that in what he gave in the little sermonette have any of us found ourselves in those kinds of situations and have we answered them i remember years ago we used to pastor the ch uh, church up in Dallas, I mean, in the Fort Worth area. And we would stop at a rest stop on the way up there on uh, Interstate 20. And almost invariably, there'd be somebody at that rest stop with a sign out there, I'm broken down, you know, we've got no money, no gas, and you've got three little kids out there, they're all dressed in dirty clothes, and you know, have got dirt on their face and everything else. Well, one time I said, okay. And I went up to the man and said, uh, how much gas do you have in your car? He says, oh, I don't even think I've got enough to get up to the next, next, next gas station. I said, well, let's go on up there, and I'll take you up there, and I'll fill up your tank, and I'll feed your entire family. We'll get a good meal for everybody up there. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I just need some money. He was just panhandling. There are people who do that. So, but don't judge every situation that you run into as this person is just panhandling. You have to have the ability sometimes to judge. And does it hurt maybe one time to make a wrong judgment? I know I've done it a couple of times. I'm sure I did. Sort of knew it going into it, but it's sort of like you better, you'd rather do that than not do something at all. And I'm sure I have probably made some wrong judgments as well along that line. It goes on to say in verse 3, For if a man think of himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. 
but let every man prove his own work. We just went through a time in the days of unleavened bread when one of the biggest words that we started it off with and maybe even used going through it was what? Examine. And that's what that word prove basically means. Examine. How are we doing? This is something we need to do as we go through this life all the time. It's not just a, a day of unleavened bread uh, sermon or a day of unleavened bread by word. It's something we need to be doing all the time to prove our own work. Then shall we have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Don't compare yourself to someone else. Everybody's got burdens to bear. You know, we could sit here and talk to one another and, and swap out stories. We've all got problems and troubles and difficulties that we go through in our lives. Some, it sometimes are greater than others. But we need to bear those burdens and help one another as we go along. In verse 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all things. That carries with it a financial communicate is really just another word of saying, you know, help somebody out financially if you need, if you can, to help them, to know, to give them the assistance that they need. Then it goes on to say in verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever we sow, we reap. If we don't do the things that he has told us to do, what are we going to reap? Nothing. If we do nothing, we're going to reap nothing. But if we do something, he says, here's what you're going to get. Do not, you said, do not be weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap, and if we faint not. To receive the things of the Spirit and receive, as it says in verse 8, life everlasting. Now, is that preaching salvation by works? No, not, not at all. What it's doing is when we ask the question, what can I do? Go to the Scriptures and they tell you what we can do. Too often we think there's nothing that we can do. We don't have the ability. We don't have this. We don't have that. Uh, when I first talked to Wes about leading songs, he volunteered and I asked him if he'd ever done it before. He said no, but he thought he could handle it. He did a great job. Okay? We don't know what we can do sometimes until we jump in there and do it. Uh, we have to get going. We have to do things. And then in verse 10, it says, the old scripture that we've all heard before, as we have therefore the opportunity, let us do good. Now, sometimes maybe we say, well, I've never had an opportunity. Then we need to change our prescription on our glasses because they're out there. Or maybe we just need to get glasses because opportunities abound everywhere in this congregation, within the churches of God, on the streets of Tyler, Texas. There are places that we can go and do help. Let us do good unto all men, but especially unto those who are of the household of faith. All of these are action words. Everything that I have mentioned there is an action word. We saw the questions that were asked of John the Baptist. We saw what was asked of Peter and the apostles. And they asked, what shall we do? Did they answer to them, attend church once a week, go to the feast, and keep the commandments? In fact, they said the commandments in one sense. Now, let's take a look for a minute here at what Christ said and then what the apostle said. In John chapter 6 and verse 26, And Jesus answered them and said, Verily I say unto do, to you, You seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you for him has God the Father sealed? Then they said unto him, What shall we do? Did Christ answer them? Yes. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him who has been sent. He said, Believe on Christ, as it were. Do we believe in Jesus Christ? It's rhetorical. But you, each of us have to answer that our own. Do we believe in Jesus Christ? Well, I think there's a little bit more here than, than meets the eye. There's more to being a Christian than just simply saying, I believe. With that comment of I believe, in effect we say I also commit. I commit to following the example of the one who I am following. 
I call myself a Christian. If we truly believe, do we do as he did? And I don't need to go over all the scriptures dealing with Jesus Christ and what he did when he was on this earth. In Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, for he is the Lord of all, that word I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about, what? Doing good. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now, I understand that nobody in this room has the power to heal. That's in the power of Jesus Christ and God our Father. But we have the power to pray for that person. That's doing good. We have the power to visit someone in the hospital, to send a card, to use a telephone to go by and see them. You know, anything that we can do to help someone, as Christ said, do. Go about doing good. Another scripture I want to look at, Matthew chapter 24. A very famous scripture for the whole book of Matthew 24, but I'm going to skip down to verse 42 in Matthew 24. It says, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord comes. A scripture we've been teaching in the churches of God since the very beginning. But know this, that if a good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. This is an analogy, story. Therefore, be you also ready. For in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man comes, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed, blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing, as opposed to sitting on our hands or sitting on our posterior and letting moss grow. We are supposed to be out doing. As I mentioned earlier, do we sit here and wait for the door to open or do we go out and do something? Well, we are participating with what the church is doing in that way, but do we have the opportunity maybe in talking to our neighbors and talking to our friends and talking to family from time to time? They may ask a question. You know, give them something to go on. Opportunities arise if we look for them. They're there at our doorstep in many cases. You might be surprised how, how many there are. Then it goes on to say, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord when he comes shall find so doing. And verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his good. So we're blessed. We'll be blessed if we are found when Christ returns to have been doing then comes that famous line <clears throat> that I think everybody in here at one time or another, and if I'm wrong, please forgive me. Uh, I have said it, and I've had a lot of people say it to me. But what can I do? I don't know. What can you do? You know that better than I do. I'm not going to sit here and list all the things that are available to be done. I've been there. I've done that before. But everyone in this room has talents, has abilities, has time, has all the things that we need sometimes to do something. I can't tell you what you're good at. I can't tell you what you can do. You have a much better feeling for that than I do. But we need to be looking into the scriptures to see all of the things that we've gone over already today of the things that we can do, the things that we have the opportunity to do in our lives. There's a scripture found over in Ephesians chapter 4 that sort of answers that a little bit. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16, it says the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. Now, we're not talking about marijuana in Colorado there. We're talking about you, every joint. You know, we got a knee, ooh, ooh, we got a knee bone, we got a hip bone, you know, we got a backbone, whatever it is, each joint supplying. According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, that will make increase in the body under edifying of itself. That's all of us working together. When we work together with all of the abilities, all of the talents that we have in this room alone, we can, we can accrue and accomplish amazing things. But if one or two or three or four or whatever it is are sitting on the sidelines and say, I can't do anything. When we mentioned something, Wes, about song leading, he stepped up. He says, I'll try it. And the second time it'll be easier than it was the first time. 
and then the third time, and we'll have him being a you know an expert up here before it's over with. We all have to learn sometimes when we take on something new. That's the reason sometimes I think we 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 think we can't do it. We've never done it before. Any of you remember the very first time you tried to do something brand new, maybe on your own? Maybe you didn't want to tell anybody about it either. Was it a rousing success? Probably not the very first time. But you get better as we get experience, as we get opportunities. So we need to all look around. What is it we can do? What is it we can accomplish? In Mark chapter 9 and verse 17, it says, And one of the multitude answered and said unto him, Master, I have brought unto you my son, which has a dumb spirit. Most of you remember this story. His child had been possessed of a spirit for many, many years and had done all kinds of things to him, thrown him into the fire, torn him asunder. And Christ asked him, and said, How long is it since this came unto you? And he said, as, a, as of a child. And at times it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, If you can believe... Remember he said earlier, believe in me. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Do we really believe that? That all things are possible to him that believes? And straightway the father and child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Have any of us ever, this is rhetorical, said something similar to that. We thought we were at the end of our rope. We'd done all we could do. We couldn't go any further. God, help me in my unbelief. I believe, but I don't believe, you know, kind of a deal. Help my unbelief. We heard it again. Christ said in John chapter 6 and verse 9, 29, believe in him. So if we believe in him, what is it that we can do? He says here, all things are possible. What is it we want to do? I heard a lady one time say, well, I can pray. Yeah, we can. We can all pray. We may not all be, you know, um, millionaires. We can't put a million dollars into the offering plate. But the Scripture gives us the example of every farthing, you know, helps. Everything contributes. No matter what it is, God can make it much greater than it actually is. A prayer that is familiar to us all I believe, help thou my unbelief. Through God, through His strength, through His Spirit, all things are possible. In John chapter 14, verse 9, he's talking with Philip. He says, He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how say you then, show us the Father? Because he had just said, If you show me the Father, then we will believe. Believe you not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me. He does the works. Believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. We have the power of the Holy Spirit available to each of us. We received it at our baptism. Is it still growing, or has it gone stagnant? Are we utilizing it? helping it to grow, we exercising it, as it were, in the things that we do, the things that we say. It goes on to say, then, then verse 13, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And if you love me, keep my commandments. Now there's, there's one that you know, we can do. We can keep the commandments as well. So I ask the question again, what can we do? Well, whatever we want to do, whatever's necessary. Okay, I, I can see how this helps us find favor with God, but how does all this help us find favor with man, like the scriptures we read at the verse beginning? Well, first, there is no more powerful witness. The best sermon that's ever been given, and you've heard me say this before, is the way we live our life. You never know who's watching. I've been amazed at our kids sometimes who we thought were asleep or were playing or doing something and they come up with the most profound question or statement about something that you thought they had no clue what was going on. If our children, for those of you that have younger children, even our older children may still be watching, one of them's probably online today, um, 
but we're setting the right example. There's no more powerful witness than the way we live our life. We are like Christ. We are fishers of men. We're not necessarily trying to convert the whole world all at once or even make everyone else a believer in the Sabbath and the holy days. It does us no good to confront others or try to prove to them that I'm right and you're wrong. So therefore, you ought to do what I say. Sometimes what we need to do is just walk alongside someone. Help them in whatever way that we can. Share the truth as we have the opportunity, and you would be amazed how much in common we have with not only most of mainstream Christianity, but with even a lot of other people who don't even profess to be a Christian. Because if we are living a moral and a principled life, then we have a, tr we have in co a lot in common with a lot of people who don't even profess to truly be Christians. They may be living a Christian life better than some that profess to be Christians. The most effective witness is not to confront and to argue with people, but to walk alongside, to help, and to teach, and to let our life speak the very loudest that it can, and let our life point other people to Christ. In Romans chapter 2, beginning verse 6, it says, God who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patience continuance in well-doing, Seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. But unto them that are contentious, who do not obey the truth, that obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil, of the Jew first and of the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that works good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Those are the promises that we have, glory, honor, peace, not to mention eternal life, for those who continue in well-doing and do the good works that we have the opportunity to do. Now, I don't really hope I have to say this to this group, but just in case someone out there is listening, I'm not preaching salvation by works. No, 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 triple, double no. What I'm saying is here, we have been called. We have been called to work. We have been called to do something. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, and it says, And you has he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's everyone who's standing before me, and especially the person standing on this stage. You has he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our own flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together by Christ. For by grace you are saved, and has raised us up together. He has made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The theme continues to go on and on throughout the scriptures. We are called to good works. Go home after church today and write down on a piece of paper all of your good works over the last weeks or months or so, but which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. All we are doing is answering the question, what shall we do? After we have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, after we have, been, we have repented and been baptized, what shall we do? What shall we do? Verse 10 says, we were created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So here is the wonderful good news. Do these good works. Follow the example of our Savior. And thus we find favor with God. And by doing good to all mankind, so we keep the commandments. We don't forget mercy and truth. There is a natural law that says, so shall you find favor and good understanding with man in the sight of God and man. 
That's again from Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 4. So fellow laborers, fellow Christians, what are we going to do? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that has promised us. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Wasn't saying that during all that I was saying. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. Is the day approaching? The day of the return of Jesus Christ? The day sooner than it was yesterday. I'm not setting any dates. Never have, never will. Scriptures say we'll know. And so just as our elder brother, our Savior, and our soon coming King said, follow his example and find favor with God and man.